Good morning. My name is Morley Singh, and I'm a member of the Board of Trustees for Mainline Unitarian Church. I welcome all of you here in the sanctuary and online to our service today. I am joined by our worship team led by Reverend Kim Wilson, our guest minister. Reverend Kim is a, long is a lifelong UU. She was ordained in 2001 and served the Shoreline UU Society in Madison, Connecticut for six years. Later, she served the UU Fellowship of the Poconos in Stroudsburg from 2012 until this past January. And as of tomorrow, she will begin serving the UUs of Central Delaware in Dover. When she's not engaged in ministry, Reverend Kim enjoys gardening, nature, yoga, and spending time with family. The other members of the worship team are Dawn Star Sarah Sporchild, Director of Lifespan Faith Development, Chris Cavalieri, our worship associate, and Danton Arlotto, our musical guest. A special welcome to those of you who are visitors here. Please join us for refreshment and conversation after the service and visit the welcome table in the lobby or our website at mluc.org to find more about us. We are Unitarian Universalists. We affirm religious freedom and celebrate diversity. We believe all people are inherently worthy and dignified. Whoever you are, wherever you come from, whomever you love, whatever your personal circumstances, you are welcome here. I have a brief announcement from our board president. She said 90 seconds, you've used like 15 of those coming up here. Sorry, 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 sorry Marlies. Good morning. Good morning. Yester Sunday, that's a hard word to say, I was at this pulpit letting you know about an opening on the board because MS is your new MSM. How many people know what that means? Madeline Seiko is your new membership and stewardship manager. And so we have an opening. We have another one this week. No, we don't. No, we don't. Give me time. Um, just want to clarify some eligibility rules. So if you rolled off in the past 36 months, you are not eligible. If your initials are Ron Rose, you're especially not eligible. But I'm not, I don't really want to dissuade anyone from joining, but I just want to let you know that if you want to serve, I'm happy to have you and you're welcome, but the sentence is 36 months. You'd be filling in for Madeline, who would have another 24 to go. So, um, you know, we have a retreat coming up next month, and if you have an idea of how visions of ministry and open questions and implementation plans and telling the staff what to do and how to do their jobs, how it all fits together. Join us, consider doing a second term. Um, that's it. Thank you, Marlies. Don't be mad. Um, I don't have any more announcements. Uh, I just want to encourage you to look at your order of service and see what activities we have planned for the coming week. Um, and look at your e-notes. Um, I hope you can all help us with the back-to-school backpack program that we have for Family Promise families. Um, that's kind of, we need to have those backups and backpacks and supplies ready by the middle of August, so please get on it right away. At this time, please take a moment to silence your cell phones and then join me in reciting our mission statement. 
Together, we transform lives through love, service, and our welcoming faith. And we will light the chalice now. We light this chalice for the energy, delight, and creativity of play. In the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson, it is a happy talent to know how to play. These words come to us from Carl Seberg, and I've adapted them slightly. Let there be joy in our coming together this morning. Let there be truth heard in the words we speak. Let there be help and healing for our disharmony and despair. Let there be silence for the voice within us and beyond us. Let there be joy in our coming together. Now do I have a mic? Now I have a mic. Hopefully it will stay. My own fault for not checking the batteries. OK. So Dr. Benjamin Spock once said, a child loves to play. Not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Which I like a lot because actually I have to confess that playing is a little bit hard for me. Or at least play that looks to other people like play. The, the thing is that what's fun for me doesn't always look like what should be fun to other people. Sometimes I'm having fun doing something that doesn't look like it's fun at all to somebody else. And a good example of this is that when I was a little kid, my brother and I like to play covered wagon on our bunk bed. And what I thought was fun was stocking the covered wagon with all of the things that we would need on our adventure and making it all neat and tidy and 
putting the blanket just right so that it was a covered wagon and not an uncovered wagon. And what my brother thought would be fun would be to get going and start shooting things. <laughs> so every time we played this game, there was this dispute over, were we ready to go yet? But could we please be ready to go already? But I'm having so much fun getting ready to go. So, and, and this still plays out in my adult life, whereas this trip that I went on this summer, I went on a five-week road trip, for anyone who doesn't know, and we had a great time. And the best part of it for me, not the best part, I think the Grand Canyon was the best part, but the other best part was that when we got to a place where we were staying with family for five or six days, I had a project to work on. I had things to do. I didn't have to just sit there and be on vacation. It was wonderful. So, the other thing I wanted to say about play and it being hard, though, is something that I think would be a lot easier to show you than to tell you. So I'm going to ask you to play with me with, with these balls. So I'm going to go off mic for a second because my mic isn't working. But basically, I'm going to throw the balls at you, and you're going to try and keep them in the air. OK? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I know nobody wants to stop, but so was that easy? <laughs> I mean, there's a way in which it's easy because it's not, you know, a dodgeball. Nobody's getting hurt. Nobody's getting struck in the head in an unpleasant manner. <laughs> Send them back. Send them back. Thank you. <laughs> so in one way, it is easy, because it's not like something terrible is going to happen if you don't do it right. It's just for fun, right? But in another way, it's hard, because you don't, it's really hard to make them go the direction you want them to go, because they're so light and not very aerodynamic. <laughs> and it's very unpredictable. You're, you know, sometimes it comes at you, and you're surprised. And sometimes it goes somewhere you weren't expecting, and you're surprised. And it's very hard to plan. You can't like decide, well, I'm going to send this ball back to Wendy, and then she will send it over, over here to Deirdre. You know, you can't really plan it out that way. You just have to do whatever's coming. Yeah. And that's sort of the point of play, is, is that it's, it's good practice for what the rest of life is like, because sometimes we are pretty surprised by what life throws at us. And it's not always as easy as a beach ball. <laughs> and sometimes we try to make plans, and they don't go the way we were expecting. And sometimes they do, and that's surprising. <laughs> so I really appreciate you taking a few minutes to play with me today. We're going to, um, the, the kids and Kelly and I are going to head out into the atrium and figure out where we're going to be for the day. We do have nursery care if you want it, but you're welcome to stay in the service if you have little ones. And we'll see you at coffee hour. Thank you. Um, in relationships and in communities which trust each other, we share our personal joys and sorrows, believing we are not healed, we are healed not in isolation but in community. 
Candles of Community is our ritual of personal sharing and support. After each candle is lit, please join me in saying, Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're gonna do offertory outreach first. <laughs> I get so excited by the balls. <laughs> um, and all the metaphors that I could pull forward from watching everybody take care of one another as you were hitting the balls. Um, as is our custom, we donate half of our weekly collection to a worthy organization in need. Our offertory outreach for July and August is Family Promise, formerly known as the Interfaith Hospitality Network of the Mainline. Um, Mainline Unitarian Church is one of 12 host congregations that periodically used to provide, I mean, we would actually house them here, homeless families with um, home cooked meals and a place to sleep and feel safe. But since the pandemic, things have changed and the families now stay overnight at the Family Day Center in Norristown. And many costly adaptations have been made and the needs of the organization um, continue and evolve as they continue to assure accommodation for families. So our offering outreach funds will enable Family Promise to continue their vital work to connect families to community resources and empower them to achieve and maintain affordable housing. So we invite you to please donate, gen, donate generously. For those of you watching remotely, you can use the Give link on our church website. You can also text your, uh, your offering by following the directions. And I'm going to invite the ushers to please come forward to collect the offering.
Now let's talk about personal sharing and support. After each candle is lit, please join me in saying, we hold you in our hearts. We light a candle to lift us up and fuel us for the continued courage and persistence as we navigate through COVID variants and challenges. For all those affected and to all of us, we hold you in our hearts. We light a candle of sorrow for the folks and families in Kentucky whose lives are lost and forever changed by the catastrophic flooding this week. For the people of Kentucky, we hold you in our hearts. And we light a candle of continued concern and sorrow for the people of the Ukraine who continue to suffer harm, displacement, and direct attacks. For Ukraine, we hold you in our hearts. And finally, we light a candle of compassion for all those for whom play is a privilege and not afforded to them because of the struggles they're within. For all those in struggle, we hold you in our hearts. And for joys and sorrows, unspoken or too deep for words, we light a candle. This reading comes to us from Maria Lugones, and it's excerpted from a paper she wrote called Playfulness, World Traveling, and Loving Perception. We are by the river bank. The river is very, very low, almost dry, but mostly is wet stones, gray on the outside. We walk on the stones for a while, you pick up a stone and crash it onto the others. As it breaks, it is quite wet inside and is very colorful, very pretty. I pick up a stone and break it and run toward the pieces to see the colors. They're beautiful. I laugh and bring the pieces back to you, and you are doing the same with your pieces. We keep on crashing stones for hours, anxious to see the beautiful new colors. We are playing. The playfulness of our activity does not presuppose that it is a particular form of play with its own rules. Rather, the attitude that carries us through the activity, a playful attitude, turns the activity into play. Our activity has no rules, although it is certainly intentional activity, and we both understand what we are doing. The playfulness that gives meaning to our activity includes uncertainty. But in this case, the uncertainty is an openness to surprise. This is a particular metaphysical attitude that does not expect the world to be neatly packaged, ruly. Rules may fail to explain what we are doing. We are not self-important. We are not fixed in any particular construction of ourselves, which is part of saying that we are open to self-construction. We are not worried about competence. We are not wedded to a particular way of doing things. While playful, we have not abandoned ourselves to, nor are we stuck in any particular world. We are there creatively. We are not passive. Playfulness is, in part, an openness to being a fool, which is a combination of not worrying about competence not being self-important, not taking norms as sacred, and finding ambiguity and double edges a source of wisdom and delight. We're going to enter now into about a minute of silent meditation, and I will begin it and end it with the sounding of our singing bowl.
when my son Jamie was 12, well, he's now 29, so that was a while ago, but uh, when he was 12, we were living up in Connecticut, and he went to uh, a day camp in the town of Ivoryton. And uh, on one of the days of that day camp week, all the parents were invited for Parents' Day. Uh, after lunch and a swim in this beautiful, clear lake at the official waterfront, uh, Jamie and I took a walk along the lakeside. There was, uh, you know, woods all around, and uh, we walked along, and pretty soon we came to a series of uh, ladder steps, and the top of the ladder steps was a platform between two trees, and there hung from a sturdy limb out over the water a uh, long rope. And uh, a father and daughter were there taking turns, swinging out on the rope and letting go and falling into the water with a big crisp splash. And then each of them would come up, the father or the daughter would come up with a great big grin on their face. And my son whispered, you want to do it? I said, well, I wasn't sure that we were really allowed to do it. And since we also didn't want to intrude on their play, you know, maybe we should just go on our way. He agreed. I could tell he wasn't so sure about how much courage he had anyway. And to be honest, I was listening to a voice in my head that said, come on, Kim, aren't you a little old for this kind of stuff? So we kept walking, and then a while later, we were retracing our steps, and once again, we came upon this rope swing. A mother and daughter were there this time. The mother was just climbing out of the water, and she was heading up the bank straight toward me, and she looked at me kind of embarrassed. She's like, I'm probably the only mother who's crazy enough to do this. <laughs> well, that was it. I said, no, you're not. I'm going to do it, too. I confess, I've loved rope swings ever since I was a little kid, and hey, I didn't want to pass up this opportunity. How often do you get to swing out on a rope swing and cannonball into a beautiful lake? So I decided to go for it. I climbed up, I grabbed the rope. Before I let myself think about it too much, I took a couple steps forward, I let the rope swing out to its full arc, and then I dropped into the water. And I came up sputtering, but I did it. I had a great big grin on my face. My son had been warned by his counselors that this swing could be dangerous. If you let go too soon, you'd hit shallow water and rocks. So he took his time to get up his courage, but then whee, he was out and then dropping into safe waters, and he came up with a proud grin on his face. Twice more for each of us, and we felt that we had gotten what we came for. Uh, not letting that opportunity for some pure fun and a little daring go by. And then, just as we were leaving, another family, a woman, a boy about eight, and last, a man, came up the path to the bottom of the steps. We stood back and watched for a few minutes. The father said he was, there was no way he was going to do it. But the son persisted, saying, come on, dad. And the mother said, oh, honey, daddy doesn't like heights. But then, <laughs> then dad said, that's all right, I'm going to do it and he climbed up the ladder, apparently pushing past his fear and manning up in front of his son. He grabbed the rope and eyed the situation, and then he swung, splashed, came up, and now he was the one with the great big grin on his face. As he climbed out of the water, I commented to him, now there's something you can add to your list of things I've done in my life. Yeah, he said, a little bit breathless, but still grinning. Being playful, of course, doesn't necessarily mean doing something daring or, or even a physical activity. Being playful starts with an attitude. There's a spirit of playfulness inside me that I bring out whenever I can, uh, when it's appropriate, of course. There was a time, though, when I had lost touch with that spirit. I was working hard at my job and at home. My other child was having problems, and I spent all my free time trying to get her the help that she needed. I just plowed my way forward through each day, doing what I felt I had to do. The turning point came after I started seeing a therapist. One day, she asked me, so, what do you do for fun? There was a long silence. I could not think of a single thing and I was horrified. 
I realized I was just juggling too many responsibilities and I wasn't leaving any time for myself to just relax and have a good time. That same day, I started making a list of things that I wanted to do for fun. And I began incorporating more of those things into my life intentionally. Now that my kids are grown and I'm older, and I've also learned to hold life's challenges a little more lightly, I find I can be playful much of the time. It helps to hang out with people who share a similar sense of humor. So we can be silly and laugh a lot together. I find that a playful attitude goes a long way toward finding ways to enjoy life and not letting the things that don't go our way get us down for too long. Enjoyment of life and resilience in the face of difficulties are not small or unimportant matters. We have the right, and not only the right, but we have a need for happiness in order to live a balanced and complete life. Laughter, joy, and contentment should not be considered superfluous. They're integral parts of what it means to be whole human beings with a full range of experiences. Regular playfulness helps us to weather the times when life is challenging. When we're swinging out on a rope, we literally take a leap of faith. We take hold of the rope, we back up, run forward a few quick steps, and then we're swinging out over open water. And then we have to let go. If we don't, we'll be in trouble. Letting go can be a little scary because once we aren't holding on anymore, we're not in control. We're moving through the air, subject to unknown forces, clinging to the faith that whatever is next, we will survive and maybe even enjoy. We open ourselves up to surprises and new experiences. For many of us, it's hard to let go of traveling a straight and narrow path through our days, a ruly path. Beyond third or fourth grade, we're actively taught that being playful or acting silly is wrong. We've been trained to be responsible, non-playful adults. On any given day, our agenda may feel set. We don't really want or Maybe we don't feel we can veer from our course for whatever reason. Maybe we're in a time crunch. We might be dealing with a crisis. Maybe we think, oh, sure, it'd be nice, but I don't really need to do this. Take a different route home just to see what you see. Bake some cookies in fun shapes, not for kids or grandkids, but just for yourself. Play a silly game like Pictionary? Kick a stone down the sidewalk. Every day there are tiny forks in the road of life where you can either go for it or let it go by. Sometimes, like launching ourselves over the water on a rope swing, we might have to give ourselves a little push. It does take some courage to be unserious. If we pride ourselves on always appearing responsible and competent, it might take a lot of courage. As the author of our reading, Maria Lugones, says, cultivating a playful attitude means being open to surprise and being willing to look foolish. Hmm, that can be a tough one. It means risking uncertainty, challenging our sense of self-importance, and realizing some rules of life can be broken. And once we rediscover our playful self, we might even decide to inhabit it more fully, to understand it better and see what its creative possibilities might be. Because being playful is creative, and it can get the mind and body moving in new directions. Neuroscientists have only recently discovered a network within the brain called the default mode network. The default mode is active whenever there's nothing else in our environment that's calling out for our attention. This is the place where our minds daydream, where we reflect on ourselves, 
and where we worry. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, it seems to be the place where what we think of as the self is constructed and maintained. In fact, sometimes neuroscientists call it the me network. It is thought that this is where we compose the story of who we are and where we link our past experiences with what happens to us and with our projections for our futures. One problem with this default mode is that we can get caught in mental loops. Many of us have experienced some form of trauma in our lives, and probably all of us have had childhood or young adult experiences that lead us to see ourselves in less than positive ways. We can get stuck in these false stories as our default mode endlessly repeats them to us as truth. So our default network can in some cases lead to negative and destructive self-regard and many forms of unhappiness. Almost all of us are in need of some form of spiritual, mental, and emotional healing. And there are many pathways that can lead us in that direction. Cultivating a sense of playfulness, especially out in nature, can be a source of that healing. I bring in nature because although the default mode network gives us this wonderful sense of individual identity, at the same time, it deceives us into believing that we are separate from each other and from the natural world and the rest of the universe. Being playful out in nature, making up games with rocks or sticks or whatever, is an act of creativity. Acts of creative play get us out of the groove of our default line of thought. As Maria Lugones says, we are open to self-construction. Nature heals us through its presence and our presence in it, reminding us of our inherent interconnectedness with all of the earth and beyond, and thus the spirit of love and life. Nature and play work together synergistically to create new grooves in our mental landscape, literally new neural pathways, opening up possibilities for new and healthier thoughts about ourselves to take root. Author Bernard de Coven has been writing for almost 50 years on theories of fun and playfulness and their healing benefits for all aspects of our health, individually, in relationships, and in community. In fact, he is known as the shaman of play. If you are looking for playfulness in your life, he offers these words of wisdom. If you look for reasons to be playful, you may find reasons, but you won't find playfulness. If you look for playfulness in the young, you will find it. If you join them, you will find it in yourself. When you draw, you'll find playfulness. When you throw your drawing away, you'll find more playfulness. When you're alone and you dance or sing, you'll find playfulness. When you dance and sing with strangers, you'll find deeper playfulness. When you dance and sing with the people you love, you'll find playfulness of the deepest kind. You'll find playfulness when you daydream when you pretend, when you make things up, when you make things for the fun of it. Love lightly, and you will find playfulness. Love yourself lightly, and you will find playfulness. Love your days lightly. Love what you do lightly. Love lightly the people you're with when you do it, and you will find playfulness everywhere. May it be so.
Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all beings.